Let's open our Bibles now, please, to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6. The Apostle Paul, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has given to us a great lesson in chapter 5 about walking in the Spirit. And he said, uh, if we walk in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, under the direction and the power of the Holy Spirit, acknowledging His presence with us always, that uh, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then he names all of those works of the flesh, all that evil, wickedness, and then he names the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, what wonderful things can happen in our lives when we're walking in the Spirit. And he said, uh, our lives will be filled with love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. One of those he specializes in tonight. And I want you to look in chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. One of the fruits of the spirit that he's talking about and he mentioned to us about is meekness. Now, meekness is uh, the opposite of stubbornness, the opposite of willfulness. I want my way no matter what. And uh, you've heard that expression, it's my way or the highway and all that kind of thing. Well, that's a stubbornness. And uh, that's a flesh. That's, that's a work of the flesh. Uh, and, but meekness is a yieldedness to God. And Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. And so he said, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, in this verse, very first verse, he's teaching us that it's possible for a brother in the Lord to fall into some kind of sin. And he said, if... One, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Uh, this, I, the idea is the fault has actually taken, uh, uh, fooled him and, and betrayed him, and he's fallen into sin. And uh, it's possible for any believer to fall into sin. Amen. And uh, we, not, we ought to be very careful about uh, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. You know, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. And pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. And uh, so everybody who thinks that they're beyond sin and beyond temptation, beware because that person is in for a fall. Why is that true? Because he's not walking in the spirit. He's walking in pride. And pride is the opposite of the will of God. God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. And uh, if when we're full of pride, we're totally in the flesh. And so he tells us it's possible for a brother, a sister in the Lord, to fall into sin. And what should our attitude be? Should our attitude be, well, look at them. <laughs> what a mess they've made out of their lives. Vote them out, put them down, and get on the phone and gossip and tell everybody about it. Or is it the right thing to do to try to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted? And, and the idea is you go to them in meekness, not in judgmentalism, not in putting somebody down, not in censuring them, but you go to them in love and you do your best to help them to come to the place where they'll repent of that sin, confess it, and get forsake, forsake that sin, and get restored to fellowship with the Lord. Now, this word's an interesting word here, uh, restore such a one. The, the word uh, was used, it's, it was used in the medical sense, if somebody had a bone out of joint, you had a shoulder out of joint or a bone out of joint, they would pull that thing and pull and put it back in joint, put it back in position. And the idea is, if a Christian has got sin in his life, then he's out of joint with the Lord. He's out of fellowship, and he needs to have that restored. And, but you don't go in there and jerk. You, know, you gently work with that person and try to help them. The word also was used. It's very interesting. For those of you who do word studies, this, this is interesting. The word was used when Jesus came by over in uh, Matthew chapter 10. You remember, Jesus going by, and he saw the disciples and uh, they were mending their nets. 
this exact same word that's translated restore, they were mending their nets. They were restoring their nets back to their usefulness. Because a net with holes in it wouldn't catch many fish. And so it had to be restored. And so he uses that word here. And he said the idea is a person who is saved and has sin in his life is out of business with God. He's out of fellowship with the Lord because sin breaks fellowship. And, and he needs to get restored back to fellowship so he can be useful to the kingdom of God. Now, is he still saved? Yes, he's still saved. Uh, and uh, he doesn't have to get saved over and over and over again. That's, not, that's, that's man's doctrine. That's not God's word. But he's out of fellowship with the Lord as soon as he has sin in his life. And did you know how easy it is to get sin in your life? How easy it is to have a wrong thought? Have, a, have an added, wrong attitude? To say something you shouldn't say? Or to do something you shouldn't do? It's, it's so easy because we're flesh. And we still have that law of sin in us. And so we have to be thoughtful one of another. And brethren, let's consider each other. And if someone has fallen, let's do all we can to restore that person to fellowship with the Lord. It's important. We're a family. God's people are family. And we're members one of another. And we need to have that kind of genuine love one for another that reaches out. And if someone is, has fallen, lift them up and help them every way you can. And this is our business. Now look at it again. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Did you notice he said, who's supposed to restore that one? The spiritual person. Now, that's a very, very close thing because in the last chapter, he said, you, ha you could be a spiritual Christian or you could be a carnal Christian. And he said, if you walk in the flesh, then you're a carnal Christian. If you walk in the spirit, you're a spiritual Christian. And so he makes that distinction here. Someone is fallen you have to have the spiritual to restore them. Now, how do you determine whether or not you're a spiritual Christian? Well, you have to examine yourself. And number one, there has to be no known sin in your life. If there's anything you know, a bad attitude or some unforgiveness to somebody or any kind of sin, whatever it is, if there's sin in your life, then you're not spiritual. You've got to get rid of that first. And how do you get rid of it? If Christians, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You, you know, that word confess there means to agree with God's judgment about it. That's what the word actually means. It means I don't try to come to the Lord and say, now, Lord, I made a mistake, but it was her fault. Like Adam did, you know, with <laughs> the woman you gave me, <laughs> you know, I, I, that's not the right spirit. The attitude is, Lord, I come to you and I confess this thing and I agree with you about it. Amen. It was wrong and I'm responsible. Well, why are we responsible? Because we, every one of us, are never going to be forced to serve the Lord. Do you understand that? You're not going to be forced to read the Bible. You're not going to be forced to pray. You're not going to be forced to go out and try to help somebody. This is a choice that you make, and God rewards you to make the right choice. And so every moment of your life, you can choose to agree to walk with the Spirit and the leading of the Spirit, or you can choose the flesh and walk away from the Lord and be out of fellowship. And so we have a choice. Now, God rewards you for choice. You know, the Lord never uh, would never have a uh, reward at the judgment seat if you were forced to do it. What, what would be the, any reward for that? But if you have a choice and you choose to serve the Lord, choose to walk in the Spirit, then the Lord can reward you for your faithfulness in making that choice. And that's why so many times in the Bible you have that decision made. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Remember Joshua? 
Yeah. And, uh, and remember uh, when you had uh, up on the mountaintop and, uh, and we have Elijah and he's saying, if God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. Make your choice. How long will you halt between two opinions? And so he's teaching us that we have choices to make. And uh, each day you have a choice. Now, do you read the Bible every day or do some days you let it get by? You made a wrong choice. Uh, do you pray every day as you really ought to pray? Or do you some days get a little lax? You made a wrong choice. You see, we have choices to make, and the Lord wants to reward us for our right choices. Now, so if someone uh, falls uh, into sin, the spiritual ones, the ones who are in fellowship with the Lord, no sin in their life, and are seeking to be a blessing. They want to be used of God, and so they go in a spirit of meekness, and they try their best to help that brother to turn from whatever sin it is and confess to the Lord and be restored to fellowship with the Savior. All right? Now look what he said. He said, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now the law of Christ is the law of love. That's what he's given to us. Not the law of Moses, not the moral law and all that, but it's the law of love. And, and he's talking about loving one another. You know what he's saying here in this verse? He's saying we need to care enough for somebody. If that brother has fallen out of fellowship with the Lord, we need to bear that burden. And that is a burden, and we need to go to that burden, under that burden, and help that brother get things squared out, squared away with the Lord. You know, in this world, more people are lost than are saved. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go therein. But narrow is the way, straight is the gate that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. I mean, by comparison, there's a whole lot more lost people than there are saved people. And uh, God's people need to care one for another, unless we become a, letter, a, a greater minority. We need to care one for another and love one another and restore one another in the spirit of meekness and care about it uh, with all our heart and soul. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, the only person that's deceived by someone who's proud and thinks of himself more highly than he ought to think is the person himself. He deceives himself because everybody else looks at him and says, well, look at that snob. Everybody else sees pride for what it is, and it can't be hidden. You know, people that are proud, they, they have a certain air about them, and, and uh, they are fooling themselves because they think that they are a little better than somebody else. And the moment we think we're better than somebody else, we've sinned. Amen. He tells us in Romans, brethren, to be sober-minded not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think right. over in the 12th chapter. Remember that? And so we're, we're going to be very careful about thinking about ourselves because who are we? We were just lost sinners. We didn't save ourselves. We don't keep ourselves safe. We're just objects of the grace of God Amen. and his goodness to us. We have nothing to glory in in ourselves. We glory in the Lord. And so anybody who thinks of himself more highly than he ought to think uh, is fooling himself. He's self-deceived. I think probably the worst deception is self-deception because that person is hard to reach because they think they're just right. They think they've arrived. And, uh, and when you think of that, brethren, you've a long way from arriving to where you ought to be. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. That's what the scripture says. Now, he says in verse 4, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now, everybody who's saved has a job to do for the Lord. You have a work to do for the Lord. The Lord didn't save you just to take you to heaven. He saved you to give you a job to do to serve him. And everyone has a, a certain responsibility. And there are people that you can reach that no one else can reach. 
There are certain people that know you, they're in your family or your neighbors who have respect to you that would not even listen to the preacher or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, but just turn them off. But you have that influence, and it's a circle of influence that you have, and every child of God has a responsibility. Amen. What does he say? For by grace, the favor that we don't deserve, are you saved through faith? And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For ye are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Amen. which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has a work for you to do. And so he said, uh, every man ought to prove himself. Look at your own life and say, am I fulfilling the job that God has given me to do? Am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I actively seeking to fulfill the position that God has given me? Am I doing what he wants me to do? Now, he said that we can have rejoicing in that. We can't glory in it as if we're somebody, but we can rejoice in it. Hey, it's a wonderful thing when God uses you. What a blessing it is when God has his hand on you and you've got the work that God's given you to do and you do it and God blesses it and you say, whoo, glory to God and you rejoice in Christ Jesus. What a blessing it is to be used of God. Some can be teachers, some can be singers, some can play on instruments, some can do so many different kinds of things. Whatever it is that God's given you to do, when you do it, examine yourself and uh, make sure that everything you're doing, everything for the glory of God, not for yourself, but for him. And then you can rejoice when God is doing something in your life. What a blessing that is. And then he said, for every man shall bear his own burden. This word burden here is a different word than the burden that we find uh, up in verse 2. This word here means your responsibility. Everybody has a certain responsibility, and uh, every man's going to bear his own burden. That is, he's going to answer to the Lord for how he fulfills his position. Now, you may have a position to do that I don't have to do, and so I don't have to answer for yours. Every man answers for his own burden, for his own uh, responsibility. And, and then, isn't that a blessing? It's a blessing that I'm not responsible to play the organ. Glory to God. <laughs> it's not my responsibility to play the pen. It's not my responsibility to be a, a, a lead singer and that kind of thing. God has called me to do what he's led me to do, to pastor, to teach, to preach, to visit, do those things that he wants me to do. And so I can look and say, am I fulfilling the position that God has given me? Am I doing what he has for me to do. And you have to do the same thing. And you say, am I fulfilling this position that God has given me? And God will be glorified and you will bear your own responsibility for that. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Everybody who's taught in the word, taught the scriptures, ought to support the one that's teaching and preaching. Plain teaching in the Bible. Uh, preachers should live the priest that preach the gospel should live with the gospel. And, uh, and it's very clearly taught throughout the Bible. You don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And God doesn't say that because he cares about the oxen, but he cares about those that are preaching. And he said, you, you really owe it to take care of your pastor. You do that. And by the way, you do that very well here at this church. You do it fine. Okay. And so, but, but uh, should the Lord take me on to glory? Uh, whoever is the pastor Take care of the pastor. Take care of him. Be sure that, uh, that he is well taken care of and he doesn't have to worry about paying the light bill and putting food on the table. You know, this guy, I've told you about this guy in Kentucky went up there and they called him to pastor this church and, and they asked him when he, when he went in, he said, is there anything we could do for you? And he said, yes. He said, I love, just really, just really, really love pork skins, and pig's feet. And they said, well, we can take care of that because we're here, I mean, we've got lots of people that have uh, hogs and that kind of thing. We can take care of that. 
And uh, so he had pig's feet uh, regularly for a whole year. Man, they just kept him taken care of and all that. And on the anniversary uh, of uh, his being there, he came in and he said, I want to thank you people. You have been so gracious and so good. You've taken care of me. You give me a pork, uh, pork feed all, all, all year long, and you've just really been so gracious. But he said, would it be okay if in the next year we eat a little higher off the hog? Now, that's the way we want to be, <laughs> you know. You, you take care of your pastor and, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, his, he doesn't have a burden of finances as well as a burden of the care for all the people and the visitation he does and the hours he spends uh, preparing messages and, and praying and all that. Don't load him down with another burden of finances. Take care of your preacher. All right, so then he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The idea could be tied in with whether you're taking care of your preacher or not, but it goes beyond that. He said, uh, You can't mock God. If God tells you to do something, you need to do it, whatever it is. And I've so often reminded you that the one thing that Mary said, you know, she said, whatever he says to you, do it. That's some of the greatest advice that ever came. And, and so whatever God says for us to do, that's what we need to do. Not to question it and say, well, this church teaches one thing, this church teaches another and all that kind of stuff and trying to hide behind different things. Look, just take what God said and do it. It's not that hard if you have the right spirit and the right heart in you. Just, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. Whatever he says, I will do. And so he said, don't be deceived. Uh, that, again, goes back to that self-deception. A person is deceiving himself if he thinks he can fool God and mock God's word. Now, so notice what else he said. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now, that idea is the physical body. If you sow to the flesh, you, you, you know, you try to live just for the flesh and to satisfy the lust of the flesh, and you do that kind of thing, you're going to reap corruption from that. Uh, many doctors will tell you that the patients they take care of are the result, the sicknesses, the diseases, the debilitations, the result of the way people have lived. Because they lived a certain way, that's why they're suffering as they suffer. And uh, not, that's not always the case. Sometimes, sometimes it's chastening of the Lord to use to correct us, and sometimes it's just to strengthen our faith and uh, say, the Lord brought me through this. He could bring me, bring me through whatever else I have to go through. But you understand, he's saying here, if you sow to the flesh, now that he goes back to chapter 5, and the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, and then all those kinds of idolatry and witchcraft and all of those other wicked sins, and then emulation and strife and variation and seditions and all of those different things he mentions in jealousy. If you give in to those things, you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap those kinds of things in your life. That's taught throughout the Bible. You know, it really is. If you sow, uh, you'll reap. Uh, someone says to the law of the harvest is, uh, you reap what you sow. But you reap also more than you sow. And you reap longer than you sow. And so we must be very careful about what we sow in our lives. You can sow good deeds you can sow uh, words of encouragement to others. You can sow so many good things to help, be a blessing and a help to others, and you'll reap that. But if you sow evil and jealousy and division and strife and sedition, and you sow discord among brethren, you're going to reap that too. Yes. And so be very careful what you sow. But he said... Uh, he said, uh, you'll reap what you sow. He that soweth sparingly 
shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. And uh, we're going to talk about giving to the Lord and his work. We'll reap, be, reap the benefit of that. Now, he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. He'll reap those things which refer to everlasting life. He'll answer those things. He'll hear those things. You know what he said? He said, when you serve the Lord, it's never in vain. Amen. Whatever you do is not in vain in the Lord. And, and whatever you do for him, you're going to receive a reward for it. If you do it truly for him, not for yourself, but for pat on the back or for the praise of man, but for the Lord, if you do it for him, you're going to be rewarded for it. How wonderful. Even Jesus said, even you can't even give so much as a cup of cold water in my name without receiving a reward. And it doesn't take a whole lot to give a cup of cold water. But if you do it for him and you're serving him, there's a reward. What a marvel that is. And if you suffer for Christ, there's even a greater reward. Paul said, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. He said, for this light affliction which we suffer for a little time works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How marvelous it is and wonderful it is to serve the Lord. There's always going to be a reward. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor and work of love for the Savior. And so he said in verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Do you know what he's teaching here? It's a word of encouragement. Don't get Weary of doing what you ought to do in serving the Lord. Don't, don't get weary. You know, now, there's a little warning in that, of course, you understand, because it's possible to get weary in doing what you ought to do. And the devil is going to get right on top of that thing and try to do his best to make you weary. But may I say it this way? You can be weary in the work, but don't ever get weary of the work. Amen. You can get weary in the work, but never get weary of the work. You just keep on keeping on. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And, and so he's saying, you're going to have a reward at the judgment seat if you don't faint. Now, the, the word uh, syncophe here, it, it's, it's a word that means to cease activity. Just like a person faints. You ever see anybody faint? Hmm? Maybe you fainted. Well, they just cease activity. You can't get any work out if somebody's fainted. <laughs> so, so he's saying, don't get weary and faint in the work of the Lord. Just take back and say, Lord, renew me. And though Paul said it this way, though the outward man perishes, yet is an inward man renewed day by day. You get that inner strength from the Lord. And I remember what Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so we're just going to keep on keeping on and faint not. Now the last verse, as we have therefore opportunity to do good unto all men, let us do good unto all men, especially to them uh, who are of the household of faith. Our responsibility is to do good to everybody we can. And according to the, uh, the resources God gives us, out of those resources, we try to be a blessing and try to help people. The more God gives us, the more responsible we are to be a blessing and to do that, which is, which is honoring to the Lord. You, you understand that. But what he's saying is so very important. We need to look for those opportunities. You see what he's saying? Let us do good as we have opportunity. Those opportunities will come our way. And we can have those opportunities to do good. So when they come, don't let that opportunity get away from you. Go ahead and do good to everyone you can, according to the resources God's given. And then he said, especially to Christians. Do you see what he said? Especially them that are household of faith. We need to care one for another. 
We ought to minister to one another, love one another, pray to be a blessing one to another. And as we do, God's hand will be upon us. Let's pray together. Now, Father.